Now, in a major reversal, Sir Keir Starmer is about to pull the plug on Labour's £28 billion yearly green infrastructure investment pledge, blaming it on economic uncertainties caused by the Conservative government. As recently as Monday, Starmer emphatically backed his own initiative. We're going to need investment. That's where the £28 billion comes in, that investment that's desperately needed for that um, mission. And I've been unwavering in relation to the mission, clean power by 2030. Unwavering, yeah. Well, his shadow energy security and net zero secretary Ed Miliband gave this borderline unhinged speech last year, eulogising Labour's green commitments. Their record says it all. Their record says it all. Your energy bills have rocketed because they didn't build a clean energy future for Britain and they left us exposed to Putin's war. They banned onshore wind and energy bills went up. They cut energy efficiency and bills went up again. And just last month, they trashed offshore wind, the crown jewels of British energy, and bills will stay up for years to come. You see, every time they turn their back on a clean energy future, they leave us exposed to global fossil fuel markets at the mercy of dictators and petrostates, and they drive up bills and make us more insecure. Well, that didn't age well, did it? Starmer's latest U-turn has caused anger throughout the Labour ranks, who see this move as an unprincipled abandonment of yet another policy and rolling over in the face of Conservative pressure. Former Tony Blair adviser John McTiernan didn't miss hit, mince his words either, slamming the decision as one of Labour, Labour's most foolish moves yet, questioning the party's leadership. Now, this will clearly be seen as a betrayal of Labour's green agenda. The move has already riled up environmentalists who are demanding more decisive action to achieve net zero targets by 2050. And Unite, a major Labour donor, expressed deep disappointment, warning that this retreat could further erode workers' trust in Labour promising, promises regarding the green transition. The shift following intense Internal wrangling was spearheaded by Labour's shadow chancellor, Rachel Reeves, who argued it was crucial to maintain the party's fiscal prudence ahead of the general election, which is likely to be fought over the economy. But Starmer's latest flip-flop also comes hot on the heels over scrutiny over the costs of Labour's home insulation scheme, casting doubt on the party's economic credibility. So has Sir Keir Starmer capitulated to Tory attacks and undermined Labour's chances of tackling the climate crisis, or is this a shrewd political manoeuvre, dropping an expensive policy that was unlikely to woo many votes anyway? With that in mind, we're asking that question. Why are you not buying into the green agenda? Our lines are now open, 0344 499 1000. Joining me in the studio, lawyer and writer, friend of the show, Luke Gittos, is back with us. Afternoon to you, Luke. Um, Afternoon. This is going to be very embarrassing, isn't it, for Starmer? Because this wasn't just a bit of a policy. It wasn't just a, a, a slight a facet of a policy. This was, like, centre stage stuff. This was meant to be the big difference between them and the Conservatives. £28 billion every year yeah. spent on green issues set to be scrapped. Well, the first thing to say is I don't think it should be news that Keir Starmer changed his mind That's anymore. a good point. I mean, he's changed his mind on everything that got him elected as Labour leader, including tuition fees and other issues. But moving on to the substantive uh, issue, look, this was meant to be a big investment pledge, and those things are quite rare in politics now, actually arguing that we should be putting money into the economy yeah. to stimulate growth, to stimulate the absolutely dire state of the British economy at the moment. I mean, yeah. we have productivity at very, very low levels and have had for a very, very long time. Someone needs to do something about that. Whether you call this green investment or, or otherwise, you know, this was at least investment. It was at least an attempt to create new industries. Labour hadn't even got as far as spelling out precisely where this money would go. There was talk about insulation, there was talk about research into R&D and, and, and new industries. But that talk about new industry, that idea that we could put money into the economy in order to yep. generate growth and generate productivity was a good thing, and it's gone. And I think what we need to understand, I think there is a bigger picture here, because this isn't just Labour. We have a governing class that simply can't get things done. Yeah. That's the big story here. Whether it be the Rwanda plan, whether it be all the, you know, any big political project, HS2, and now this big investment scheme. This is all uh, symptomatic of a political class that can't get things done, that can't commit, can't carry their promises through to policy. And the result is that the British public are completely disengaging from politics. 
So Keir, Starmer, Keir, Keir Starmer's approval rating is low. They have a points lead, obviously, uh, against the Tories in polling. But when you look at individual leadership performance, 45%, according to YouGov, still think Keir Starmer is doing badly as Labour leader. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Rishi Sunak's not faring any better. But we have a political class that completely fails to inspire people. I wonder, Luke, whether... Now that we're heading towards an election, I think we're at that point where Labour get to look at the books, as it were, mm. and that they, they get some access to the various departments and, and, and expenditure and the like. I wonder whether someone's just had a quiet word in his shell-like and said, Mr Starmer, this, if you want to do this, then you can, but you can't do that, you can't do mm. that, and you can't do that. And it's as simple as that. There is no magic money tree. But I think the British public are crying out for some kind of big idea. They don't want another election fought over who can be the most responsible... Yep with uh, p pinching a bit here and pinching a bit there. Yeah, yeah. It's deeply uninspiring. What people want is some talk about where we go in the future, where we're going to be in 10 or 15 years' time. And if we could genuinely inspire people around this image of an economy that's self-reliant, that invests in new technology, I don't care if you call it green or not, if it's, a, if it's an economic step that increases our energy independence, yep. that creates new industries, that creates new jobs, that has to be a good thing. But we need a governing class that's capable of arguing for it. Exactly That's capable right. of putting, putting the case. And there is, in, the, in the States, yeah. there's a sort of a fringe of Republicans who, you know, bearing in mind a Republican is like 28,000 steps to the right of the yeah. Conservative Party in this country, who are... They're called something like Republicans for the Environment or something mm. like that, because they've spotted exactly that. They've gone, look, do you know what? Forget whether you want to buy into the environmental argument. This is good for business. Mm -hmm. It's good for growth. It'll create a trillion jobs. This is amazing. So they've looked at it solely from a financial point of view. But that's not what's happening here. The message we're hearing is that you're going to have to rip out your boiler. Mm. That's going to cost you five grand. You're going to have to change the way you lag your loft. That's going to cost you another 2,000 quid. Yep. But the average and the poorest people in the country will end up paying much more for this. And, and it's more un unaffordable, of course, to, to those on lower incomes. Rather than saying, do you know what, here's a big idea. Think of the Industrial Revolution. Mm. This is an, another phase of that, but it's, and it's going to be amazing. Mm. And who doesn't want cleaner energy? Mm. We all do. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, we'll find something else. But they just, they're not very good at selling ideas, and yeah. certainly even worse at pursuing the ideas they do have. Exactly. And, and they're getting rid of this for the wrong reasons. You mentioned the uh, replacing boilers. I mean, this is the net zero ideology. And the yeah. net zero ideology is basically consume less, use worse technology. We know that the technology is not there to implement net zero as things stand at the moment. Yeah. If we were to attempt to meet net zero targets, it would mean a very significant reduction in people's living standards, as yeah. things are. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean, as you suggest, that environmental technology can be, should be bad. I mean, it should improve, and we can invest in green technology in a way which makes us more energy independent and which also gives us the kind of technology which means people's living standards don't fall. Yeah, yeah. That's the kind of grand infrastructure project which could actually inspire people and get people interested and engaged. Uh, of course. But and we... if years ago they had a nuclear, as an obvious example, yeah. if, you know, 25 years ago either the Tories or Labour had said, right, we're going to properly invest in this now, we possibly wouldn't be having <laughs> the same arguments today. Uh, and it's interesting that most of the nuclear plants that are in this country are actually owned by the French. So yeah. that almost tells you... Because they spotted it and said, no, we're not going to fall for that one, we'll be prepared. And we aren't. Mm. Well, so now we're... Yeah, N nuclear is the, is, the, is the sort of elephant in the room in the energy discussion. Indeed. I mean, we have Sizewell uh, down in Suffolk, which is, uh, you know, has been meant to be built for many, many years still is, is in a state of uncertainty yep. because we just don't have the kind of political commitment to these big projects that they need. You know, nuclear is clean, it is relatively cheap, yep. and it is very safe, but no one is willing to make the leap in terms of investment, in terms of political commitment to get it done. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to this story. Uh, this is a Talk TV exclusive, foreign offenders avoiding deportation. Something we all suspect, and we're aware every now and again there's a, there's a story around this. Why wasn't this person deported? Of course, it's come to the forefront with Abdul Azidi, a man who is still on the run, a convicted criminal, convicted of a sex offence, and yet, for some bizarre reason, mm. he interestingly converted to Christianity, uh, had some kind of messianic, euphoric moment, and... Um, became a Christian uh, and wasn't deported. Mm. He, he was allowed to stay despite that offence. Um, and there is a whole list of this. Just 3,577 foreign offenders were deported in the year ending September 2023, while 10,423 remain behind bars and another 11,000 are living in the community but are subject to deportation action. Yeah. 
what the hell does that even mean? Well, I, Deportation I, action is saying you're being deported yeah, and right. then deporting them, surely. <laughs> well, it doesn't. I mean, so I've, I've had lots of clients who are foreign... I'm a criminal defence lawyer by trade, and uh, I've had lots of clients who are foreign nationals who commit an offence and are sentenced to prison. And the, the normal advice when you go and see them is you are leaving this country when you, when you come out. I mean, there is a summary procedure. The Home Office get in contact. They're saying you're being deported. And that's usually a very quick summary process. Yeah. I think what we're seeing here is the creation and exploitation of loopholes. So the issue, apparently, with Azadi was that he had... Um, uh, Abdul Azadi, the, uh, the, the, the chap who's still on the run in respect of the Clapham attack, there was apparently a loophole which meant that because he'd served what's called a suspended sentence, meaning he didn't actually spend any time in prison, physically in prison, he was allowed to serve... So, a therefore, custodian. he swerves that rule. He swerves that rule. And so what we need to look at are the loopholes that bog down our asylum system, and particularly when dealing with foreign offenders, because yeah. we know... You know, there's been very recent research by the Solicitor's Regulation Authority, my governing, my regulatory body, that shows that there are people who are exploiting unfavourably loopholes in our asylum system in order to gain, in order to gain it. So that needs to stop. Mm. Um, and I think, hopefully, it can be relatively straightforward. If it is a case of just changing a rule so that anyone who is sentenced to any kind of custodial sure. sentence is deported as quickly as possible, then... Uh, that could that that could mean that that loophole is closed down. But th there are these kind of loopholes in our asylum system that need to be fixed. And there are, I'm afraid, as a matter of fact and as a matter of record, unscrupulous lawyers who are willing to exploit those loopholes there when is. they're identified. And when we've got one of the grooming gang main culprits walking the streets, sometimes even bumping into his victims in mm. supermarkets because he's not been deported, was told he will be deported. Ernesto Elliott, uh, a Jamaican man, 17 crimes on the rap sheet while living in the UK, um, and used the Right to a Family Life card to dodge deportation before then going on to commit murder mm. in 2021. An Iranian paedophile, known only as M.M., convicted of a sick child offence, jailed for five years in 2013, but despite being considered a danger to the public, evaded deportation after claiming he converted to Christianity, there it is again, which will put his life at risk if he goes back to Tehran. And it goes on. Another one from Syria here. Avoided deportation 2015 after serving an 18-month sentence for a sex attack. Authorities could not return him to a country in a civil war, despite all the evidence suggesting he was actually from Egypt. Yeah, I mean, we shouldn't put up with it. <laughs> and, and no country in the world should put up with it. If I went to live in Spain, I committed a crime in Spain, whole, a horrendous crime, I would expect to be deported back from where I came from. I don't expect anything else uh, of, the, of, of the criminals who, who, who are living here. So we have to get a grip on it. Um, the problem is that, again, we have a governing class who are unwilling to look at the detail of the law that's emerged around asylum, including the Human Rights Act, which we can talk about, the, uh, the uh, Refugee Convention. All of these pieces of law have been on... Um, have influenced our legal system for a very long time, some of which are on our normal statute book, yep. some of which are international law. But actually getting into these pieces of law and understanding how they operate is not something that our current governing class really want to do. Indeed. So that's why we have these loopholes. That's why we have these endless, uh, you know, stories coming out, tra tragic stories about people who have gamed the system and then gone on to commit further uh, appalling crimes. It has to stop. Very briefly, if we can, Luke, uh, British countryside is racist and colonial white space, uh, according to wildlife charities. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've heard this story before. I think it was around a few years ago. British countryside is racist and colonial white space, according to the charities. They've told a, a load of MPs. The claim was made by Wildlife and Countryside Link, a group with 80 members, including the RSPCA and the WWF. Are these yeah. people... Have they got too much time on their hands? Are they just mad? There's a bit of that. I think there is a serious sociological point that comes out of this report, which is that um, ethnic minorities uh, tend to live it, uh, far away from green spaces. They tend to live in cities uh, and they tend to lack access to green spaces in a way which white people don't. That's perhaps unsurprising. I've lived in London all my life. I have, you know, family members who live in the countryside. There are simply fewer, fewer black and ethnic minority people in the countryside. That yeah. won't come as news to True. anyone. Um, and also white working classes as and, well. Exactly right, white working classes as well. Um, so this is, this, th there is an interesting sociological point there about how that arises. Does it tell us something more about levels of poverty? Does it tell us more yeah. about inequality more deeply? The problem is that these organisations, like, what's this got to do with the National Trust? Or, or whoever, it's because these point. are all organisations yeah. that are uh, part of this report, as I understand it. But, but it, for, for me, it, it portrays the fact that every single concern has to be dressed up in this university woke language about 
um, race and about racism. Yeah. I mean, the countryside is not inherently racist. Of course, it's a stupid comment. No, it? it is. It's a stupid comment. But... There is a, there's a serious point at the heart of it, but it gets dressed up in language, which makes it sound ridiculous. Com completely. Luke, always good to see you. Thank you. Uh, Luke, get us with us here on Talk TV.